Joining us today on the Alagos Radio and the Alagos Interview Series is international lawyer and professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law, Dr. Francis Boyle. In an illustrious legal career, Boyle has represented Bosnia, Palestine, and Hawaiian independence groups in the international arena, and has served on the legal team which led to the conviction of George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and Tony Blair for war crimes as part of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission. Having first spoken on the Alagos Radio back in 2016, Professor Boyle returns to our program today to discuss the hot-button issue of the Macedonia name dispute and the PRESPA agreement. Professor Boyle, welcome back to our program today. Well, Michael, uh, thank you very much for having me on, and uh, my best personal regards to uh, all my friends there uh, in Greece. Let's dive right in to the main issue at hand, the Macedonia name dispute and its purported solution, the PRESPA agreement, which was signed between Greece and its neighbor, which was known as the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, or FIRAM, last June. You've recently given interviews to media outlets in Greece's neighbor, asserting that the PRESPA agreement is invalid and specifically that it violates the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Let's start by asking, what is the Vienna Convention and how is the PRESPA agreement in violation of this convention? Well, Michael, I'd I'd like to suggest before we get into the technicalities here, and I'm happy to answer that, we look at the politics. When I first read this agreement at the request of the Macedonians, what I noticed was that it had been brokered and negotiated by Matthew Nimitz. And Nimitz is a longtime U.S. imperial apparatchik. You have to understand that. And he's done work for the United States government uh, all up and down. So basically, the Americans were using him as a cutout in order to uh, accomplish their objectives here, which, as I see it overall, was to get Macedonia into NATO by hook or by crook. Second, if you look at Nimitz's record here, he's a trustee of Central European University in Budapest, and we all know that's George Soros. He also is in cahoots with Soros. So that seems to me what the geopolitics here. Second, they say that this agreement, which is in English, as you know, and it's very technical if you go through it. And I I did read it to give that interview to the uh, Macedonian news media. It's highly technical. It is said it was drawn up by Brookings. But again, Brookings here is just being used as a cutout for the State Department. It's clear if you read through these documents, and I do this professionally, these documents, this uh, PREPSA was drawn up either by lawyers who worked for the United States Department of State or used to work for the United States Department of State and were hired by Brookings to do this job. So we have to look, as I looked at it in going through the document, within this context of American foreign policy and what their objectives are here. And basically to impose this on Macedonia, to impose it on Greece, and for the purpose of getting Macedonia into NATO, which they have now done. So mission accomplished. And also, the other thing you have to keep in mind here, the documents are all in English, and the agreement is in English. My understanding, a translation was presented there to the Greek parliament and the Macedonian parliament in Slavic and uh, Greek, but you really don't know what those translations said. The Americans do stuff like this all the time, where they'll negotiate an agreement in English, then translate it to be imposed on foreigners, then translate it into the local languages for domestic consumption, and sometimes the translations are completely bogus. This happened in the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty, which I also analyzed in my capacity there for the uh, Palestinians, where all the documents were in English and was negotiated by uh, uh, President Carter under his auspices. But when it was presented to the two parliaments in um, Egypt, Uh, and Israel, it was translated into Arabic and Hebrew by someone, and it it turns out, if you read the local news media, I just read the English English press there, 
it's like they had two different treaties, that the leaders were lying to their own people about what these documents really contained in order to get them through the uh, parliament. So, I, you know, I think your scholars there really have to look and see what that translation was all about there in Greece, and also what was the translation there in Slavic to be presented to the uh, uh, Macedonian parliament. I don't know. But the Americans have pulled these uh, types of uh, tricks before uh, on translations. And that then gets us into the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, uh, both uh, Macedonia and Greece are a party to the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties that governs everything possible uh, with respect to uh, treaties and how treaties are to be dealt with uh, internationally by governments and also by the um, International Court of Justice. So, uh, with respect to this uh, translation issue, and I don't know what you know what they presented there to the uh, Greek Parliament, what what the uh, 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 Greek version of this said. But you can uh, invalidate a treaty on uh, Article 49 uh, of the Vienna Convention on grounds of fraud. If a state has been induced to conclude a treaty by the fraudulent conduct of another negotiating state, the state may invoke the fraud as invalidated its consent to be bound by the treaty. So, depending on what the translation said, Greece might be able to uh, invoke one or more grounds here. Uh, uh, of the Vienna Convention to uh, uh, invalidate this treaty if, in fact, that is the case. And I don't know. As for uh, Macedonia, it was explained to me by a professor of political science there, not a lawyer, but a professor of political science, who I, I take it she knew what she was talking about, that the treaty was rammed through the Macedonian parliament in violation of the Macedonian Constitution. There was a blatant violation, apparently, of the Macedonian Constitution that would have required, uh, 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 I guess, a referendum and different procedures to uh, approve a treaty of this nature because it called for changes to their Constitution. Well, uh, if that is the case, and again, I, you know, I, I'm just here at a distance, but I expressed uh, my uh, opinion then that a subsequent government there in Macedonia could invalidate that treaty uh, under Article 46 of the Vienna Convention that says a state, uh, state may not invoke the fact that its consent to be bound by a treaty has been expressed in violation of a provision of its internal law regarding competence to conclude treaties as invalidating its consent unless that violation was manifest and concerned a rule of its internal law of fundamental importance. So I emphasize you can invalidate a treaty there in uh, Macedonia uh, if the violation was manifest and concerned rule of its internal law of fundamental importance. And as explained to me by this uh, professor of, of political uh, science there in Macedonia who opposed the treaty, and I have to assume she knew what she was talking about, the uh, violation of the uh, Macedonian uh, constitution was blatant and manifest. Uh, and it concerned a rule of its internal law of fundamental importance, that is, its constitution. So there's no uh, law of more uh, fundamental uh, importance to a state than its constitution. So on the basis of what she told me, I expressed that uh, opinion. So that's, you know, where uh, uh, I see it as of today. Also, with respect to Greece, uh, Article 48, uh, error, that needs to be considered. So, you know, you have scholars over there in Greece, I guess, that could look into the congruence of the uh, Greek translation with the uh, English documents, uh, because it was drafted by de facto State Department, you know, State Department uh, uh, lawyers, and that is the basis of the agreement. That is, in, in the event there is uh, uh, any uh, dispute here, uh, they have to go back to the uh, English language uh, version of the Prepta, and that's that's what Nimitz and his uh, coterie of de facto State Department lawyers drafted. So, Michael, that that's just my reading here of these uh, documents in the process from an American perspective. Obviously, you know, everyone there in Greece, 
you're entitled to your perspective. I, I know it's a highly uh, emotional issue, and it is in Macedonia, too. I, you know, I don't have a horse in this race. I'm just trying to look at it as objectively uh, as I can uh, and, and explain it, though, you know, I have a lot of friends there in Greece, and, you know, I have some friends there in Macedonia. Well, you certainly raised the uh, many issues that we're going to come back to, uh, Professor Boyle, uh, concerning Matthew Nemitz, concerning the expansion of NATO in the region. But let's pick up on this last point and the possibility of disputing the uh, PRESPA agreement on the grounds that it was not ratified in a constitutional manner. This argument has well, actually been made. No, it, it, according to this political scientist, and, and I take it she knows what she's talking about, it expressly violated the Macedonian Constitution. Now, I had read a short note on the ratification there in Greece. From what I read, it did not necessarily violate the Greek uh, Constitution. So I, I don't know about that. You'd have to talk to your uh, constitutional law experts over there. But I do raise the question of the Greek translation of the uh, English documents. Were you know who prepared this translation, and were were was this translation of the English documents a uh, a fair and accurate representation of what what the purposes said, or uh, what was a fraud perpetrated on on the Greek Parliament? I can't answer those questions. I just raised them, uh, Michael. Well, just to clarify, even for our listeners, arguments that have been made in both countries that start with uh, Greece's neighbor, the argument there has been made that, for instance, uh, their president has not signed off on these constitutional amendments that were passed uh, through uh, parliament in that country, and a referendum that was held in October did not meet the required uh, constitutional threshold. Uh, of participation of 50% plus one. In Greece, there's a bit of a gray area in that the Greek constitution says that international agreements need to be ratified by two thirds of the parliament, a supermajority, but this was passed with a simple majority. So uh, it does sound well, that. Michael, what you're telling me, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. You know, these are very technical legal questions. If that is correct, then there is also a serious problem uh, over there in Greece as well, and that Greece might be able also uh, to invoke uh, Article 46 of the uh, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties that uh, the treat this purpose is invalid uh, because it was in manifest violation of the Greek Constitution. So that needs to be nailed down, I think, by your uh, constitutional law experts uh, over there in Greece. I understand I'm not, you know, an expert on the Greek constitution, but that's a very important point you just raised now. Now, the Russian government, and specifically through statements that were made by their foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has also called into question the validity of the PRESPA agreement uh, in accordance with the resolutions of the UN Security Council uh, regarding the Macedonia issue. Now, is this an agreement that a member of the United Nations Security Council, such as Russia, for instance, could conceivably veto? And could such a veto actually strike down this agreement? Well, let me say this. If the agreement uh, violated uh, uh, Security Council resolutions, and I, uh, you have to understand, I have not read these uh, uh, resolutions, so uh, I can't uh, express an opinion on that, but the United Nations Charter clearly provides that in the event there is a conflict between the terms of the United Nations Charter and any other type of international agreement. Uh, then the provisions of, of the Charter prevail. And therefore, if we are dealing here with a uh, Chapter 7 uh, UN Security Council uh, resolution uh, that uh, uh, the, this agreement violates, yes, I think you have a very uh, good argument uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the agreement itself uh, is also uh, invalid for these grounds. Uh, but again, you would have to take your uh, scholars there and, and further develop that uh, argument uh, made by uh, Foreign Minister uh, 
lab raw. The problem is that uh, at this point, you know, Macedonia is in, in veto. The deed has been done. So I don't really see this being undone by the uh, Security Council. But, you know, your scholars would have to look into this. And indeed, that let me get that uh, uh, article of the UN Charter, Article uh, 103. In the event of a conflict between the obligations of the members of the United Nations under the present charter and their obligations under any other international agreement, their obligation under the present charter shall prevail. So uh, an obligation would be uh, a, a Chapter 7 Security Council resolution, which is would be binding on all UN member states. And if this uh, uh, purpose of violates that Security Council resolution, then, of course, uh, uh, both Greece and Macedonia, new governments, uh, would have the capability, uh, again, to find that uh, the, the agreement is is invalid. Now, I don't know, I don't believe that that's going to prevent uh, uh, Macedonia, you know, from moving forward in its, its membership in uh, NATO. But, yes, you have an additional argument, and, you know, you could uh, make that argument uh, as well under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Article 53, treaties conflicting with the peremptory norm of general international law, use Kogan's, you could certainly argue that it uh, uh, violates the terms of the United Nations Charter. So, sure, there, there are grounds there, again, that need to be considered by your Greek scholars. Now, expanding upon this uh, previous point, would you say overall that the PRESPA agreement is a done deal. So, for instance, what I mean here is that in Greece, an argument that's being made by the main opposition party is that the PRESPA agreement is a bad deal for Greece, but nevertheless, it cannot actually be disputed or overturned. It's too late now. It's final. And Greece must abide by it and stick to it. So you, you began to address this when we talked about the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But what does international law generally say about the process in which such agreements can be uh, disputed? And what legal avenues exist to, to do this? What I'm saying here is I think Macedonia is now a, a member of NATO and that's going forward. I don't, I don't see that uh, stopping. But I think a subsequent government in Greece, if what you're telling me is correct, and your uh, constitutional law scholars and your uh, uh, international law scholars of their research these points that I'm discussing, then uh, a new government in Greece could, could certainly denounce uh, the PREPSA. Yes, and a new government in Macedonia uh, likewise could uh, denounce the PREPSA. I don't believe that that point of effect uh, Macedonia's membership in uh, NATO, but I know the opposition in both countries, uh, you know, feel very strongly that this this PREPSA is is unacceptable for a variety of reasons. Now, personally, I, I would like to see, you know, an agreement between Greece and Macedonia that uh, solves the title issue. And I think that could have easily been done without all the rest of this agreement between you and you. Hey, but that, that isn't what happened. So it would really be up to a new government in Greece to denounce this agreement and or a uh, new government in, in Macedonia to denounce this agreement. But, but from what you're telling me, I, it, it sounds as if there would be legal grounds of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties for uh, a new government in Greece to do this. And I, from what this political scientist told me in Macedonia about their constitution, there would be legal grounds for the uh, a new government in Macedonia to uh, denounce it and, you know, come up with a new... It's not going to affect, I believe, Macedonia's membership in uh, NATO, but, you know, to come up with some other type of agreement uh, uh, over the name, which I understand that that's the basic issue here. Now, there's also some other issues that uh, have come up as a result of the PRESPA agreement. On the part of Greece, for instance, there was a recognition of a Macedonian ethnicity and a Macedonian language. If the PRESPA agreement was overturned, 
at some point in the future by either country. What might follow? What might be the aftermath of such an outcome? And would there still be some sort of precedent uh, set just by the fact that this agreement did exist at some point? For instance, on the part of Greece, would this fact that the current government has recognized the existence of a Macedonian language, for instance, would that be something that would carry forward even if the PRESPA agreement were to be overturned? Well, in that respect, you are right, uh, Michael, that basically you have some sort of de facto recognition on both sides of these other issues. And uh, uh, well, one would hope that they could be sorted out uh, in, in good faith uh, on the part of new governments on both sides, yes. Uh, but there's recognition it's de facto. It, it, I'm saying that right now it's de jure. But even if the PRESPA were to be invalidated, you, you'd sort of start from there saying, well, you already recognize this, that, the other thing. So all this would have to be sorted out. But I, I think it could be sorted out without this horrendous uh, uh, PRESPA agreement that you know, I, I don't, you know, it, it, between you and me, and I, uh, it, it's basically uh, uh, subordinates uh, Macedonian sovereignty to Greece. Uh, and I don't really think that's uh, a healthy situation uh, for either Greece or, or Macedonia. I, I don't see how that is going to solve uh, this dispute. I, I don't see how it is going to be able to continue uh, into the future. But I'm just speaking here as an American. You know, I don't, I don't really live over there, uh, but uh, you know, I've been to Greece and I have a lot of friends there. I haven't been to Macedonia, but, you know, I've dealt with the Balkans over there for the Bosnians and, and the Kosovars, so I have followed these matters. Now, we're speaking on the air with uh, Dr. Francis Boyle, professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law here on the Alagos Radio and the Alagos Interview Series. Now, uh, continuing on this topic of the language, uh, the Macedonian language that I mentioned a moment ago, there's an interesting argument being made over here. Uh, the argument was made by proponents of the agreement on both sides that the Macedonian language was already recognized by the United Nations in 1977 and that this recognition was accepted by Greece at that time. Although my reading, just speaking personally, uh, of the proceedings from that UN meeting in 1977 doesn't really reveal such a recognition. But in any event, that's the argument that was made. Now, if a language was already recognized by the UN and by a country such as Greece in 1977, why would it need to be recognized again a second time? Because we're told that that's what the PRESPA agreement is doing in part. It recognizes uh, the existence of a Macedonian language. And can, can you think of any similar instance in the history of international law where something has had to be recognized twice? Well, first of all, and again, I, I'm not familiar with all the facts you're mentioning, but generally speaking, you know, international law doesn't recognize languages. It, it recognizes states and it recognizes governments and, and things of that nature. Second, my, my understanding, and you know, with all due respect to the Macedonians, I, I believe they all speak uh, South Slavic there in the uh, uh, former Yugoslavia. And, and so what, what we've had with the, you know, dissolution of the uh, former Yugoslavia is for nationalistic reasons, everyone to start to call South Slavic by the name of their uh, nationality. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly what happened there in uh, Macedonia, but it has happened uh, uh, elsewhere in, in the Balkans. So... Uh, you know, I, I would think this issue could be finessed one way or the other, and um, but that you know that's the way it is. I, uh, but generally speaking, you don't have agreements recognizing uh, languages except in the uh, interwar period between the first and the second world war. Uh, there were uh, minority treaties uh, concluded that did apply to the entire uh, uh, former Yugoslavia at that time, the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, uh, directly on point. And those treaties did, did if I remember correctly, I studied them a long time ago, 
uh, I believe those treaties recognized uh, languages. But in the post-war II uh, era, you know, recognition of languages, uh, I, I don't think is something that you know, happens at this level of state-to-state -state operation. Now, we've heard from various international media outlets and commentators that the Macedonian name dispute is simply another example of nationalism in the Balkans that has run amok. I believe it was Deutsche Welle, the German uh, national broadcaster, which recently called the dispute bizarre. I believe that's the word that they used. But if the dispute is so bizarre and it's simply a petty nationalistic quarrel, then why have such actors as the State Department and NATO and the European Union and the governments of countries such as Germany been so adamantly in favor of the agreement and so involved in this process and, um, and, and, and so adamant that the agreement must be enacted and must be enforced? Well, you know, Michael, I've been involved in the uh, Balkans directly since, you know, December of 19... 92, when I volunteered my services to the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina free of charge. So I, I've been following these issues. These, these are very serious issues. Uh, and a lot of people have died over there uh, in, in the Balkans uh, over these issues. Uh, and it does need to be resolved. But regretfully, I don't think this uh, uh, preps does it. I, I think uh, what happens is they're, they're, the State Department is basically uh, decided to subordinate uh, Macedonia to the control of Greece. Uh, there's very little uh, sovereignty left here for uh, Macedonia. If you read through the uh, document, getting into all sorts of issues that normally uh, states would not surrender to the uh, control of another state. And over the long haul scheme of things, then I, I just don't see that, that this document is going to solve anything. What the Germans, you know, they're, they're doing what the Americans tell them to do. They want to get Macedonia into NATO. And that was what this was all about, to get Macedonia into NATO by hook or by crook. And uh, Nimitz uh, uh, and his de facto State Department lawyers succeeded here. And that's why... That, that's why all the NATO support, states supported this, even though I, I, I think the deal itself, the preps, is just unsustainable over the long haul. But I could be wrong about that. Now, in your view, why is it so important for NATO to expand uh, into this region, in, into the Southern Balkans? What is NATO's end goal here? And will this NATO expansion ensure security for the region or, to the contrary, might it pull the region into more conflict in the future? Well, we have to understand NATO is the United States, the United States State Department. So uh, that is their objective, to get Macedonia uh, into NATO. And likewise, like they just got uh, Montenegro uh, into uh, NATO. Uh, they want the Balkans firmly, squarely uh, into uh, NATO if they can do it. They'd also like to get uh, Serbia uh, into NATO. And it basically told uh, uh, Serbia that if you cut a deal here on Kosovo with trading land back and forth, redrawing borders, uh, then then we can move forward. But we, I mean, Pompeo recently made a statement to that effect that if you read between the lines. So they want to get all the Balkans uh, uh, into NATO if they can. You have uh, Croatia in there, Montenegro was just put in there, Macedonia was put in there, because the Balkans have always been uh, critical. It, it, it's a it, it's a pivotal location uh, between east and west, north and south. Uh, uh, all the oil pipelines uh, uh, into Europe uh, from the Middle East uh, will be going through the uh, Balkans. And then you have the control there over the uh, Dardanelles and access to the uh, Black Sea uh, a, 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 and, and egress by uh, Russia. So the uh, getting as much of the Balkans into NATO 
as they possibly can, uh, is, is an American objective, right? And then also, you know, you have Camp Bonsfield there, uh, sitting in, uh, Kosovo. And that's really what the Kosovo War was all about. I haven't been to Camp Bonsfield, but uh, apparently it's so large that you can see it from uh, outer space. And they had Camp Bonsfield in there to keep control and domination uh, over the, uh, over the Balkans. So, uh, Macedonia is just, uh, you know, a, a part of the pie as they see it. We're on the air with Dr. Francis Boyle, professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law here on the Dialogos Radio and the Dialogos interview series. And earlier you mentioned the role of Matthew Nemitz, who of course was the UN's special mediator for the Macedonia dispute. Uh, he was in this position for over two decades. I'll mention here. Uh, Matthew, let me let me interrupt here. Yes. UN special mediator. Everyone knew Nimitz was there representing the State Department. That was just a cutout. It, it was exactly like the uh, Vance Owen negotiations where uh, I uh, advised the uh, Bosnian government on those. Everyone knew Cyrus Vance represented the United States State Department and the coterie of lawyers that he had around him. He was allegedly there as the United Nations uh, special representative uh, representing the United Nations. But everyone there knew he spoke for the U.S. State Department and the uh, uh, Vance Owen uh, Peace Plan, which I did read and, and advised the uh, Bosnians uh, on, it was all drawn up by his de facto State Department lawyers. So, again, you know, this is a bit of uh, American uh, ledger domain. Let's uh, uh, br bring in our guy and give him uh, uh, some type of uh, UN uh, imprimatur to do our work for us. You have to understand that about Nimitz and his his appointment. We've been through this. We, I was through this before with Cyrus Vance for the Bosnians. So uh, it, it's the same modus operandi by the Americans. And Nimitz is something of a protege of sorts of Cyrus Vance. They've, they've worked together, uh, if one looks at their bios, basically. Uh, they've worked together going back to the 1970s in the State Department, from what I understand. Uh, I believe you're correct. That is, that is correct. It's typical the Americans, they haul out one of their longtime imperial operatics and then they sort of uh, baptize him with the blue of the uh, United Nations to give him uh, credibility, but he's still basically working for the uh, U.S. State Department. That's my reading of Nimitz, sure. And that was what Vance did in the uh, Vance Owen negotiations, right? Now, in an investigation that I conducted uh, regarding Matthew Nimitz, some interesting things came up, one being a, an NGO that Nimitz himself founded, and it's based in Thessaloniki, which is Greece's second largest city, and in fact, it's the capital of the Greek region of Macedonia and northern Greece. This NGO is called the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeastern Europe. It receives funding from the State Department, the British Foreign Office, the European Union, even the Greek Foreign Ministry. And what's interesting about it is that it publishes history textbooks that are distributed to schools in many Balkan countries. And these books, long before the Prespa Agreement, recognized the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, which was its official UN name, uh, simply as Macedonia. But there's also other things about Nimitz as well that came up in this investigation as well. Uh, he, he remains on the board of directors of this NGO. He's not just the founder, but he's still on the board of directors, but he's also on the board of advisors of an outfit called the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And the vice chairman of this committee, Nancy Soderberg, is the former vice president of the International Crisis Group. And this International Crisis Group in 2011 proposed the name Republic of North Macedonia and the name that ended up coming out of the PRESPA agreement. And 
There's other things as well. Nimitz is the former chief operating officer of General Atlantic LLC, which was a shareholder in Denmark's Saxo Bank, which operated a banking subsidiary in Greece for a period of time uh, in recent years. Um, In light of all of the above revelations, can an argument be made by either side or by both sides that Matthew Nimitz was not impartial in his role as mediator between the two countries and the Macedonia dispute. And on this basis, could either country or both countries dispute the PRESPA agreement based on a conflict of interest? Well, as I said before, Nimitz was there as a U.S. imperial apparatchik to ram an agreement through the throats of both Macedonia and Greece, no matter what, so that they could get, the Americans could get Macedonia into NATO, which they have now done, no matter what the cost to the Macedonians and the Greeks. Now, whether you would actually be able to uh, impeach Nimitz legally is another issue. Uh, I'm aware as I'm aware of his background. I pointed out he's also in cahoots. He's working in cahoots there with Soros. And, you know, uh, Hungary just threw Soros out of uh, Hungary. Soderbergh, you know, long-time U.S. imperial apparatchik. That's the way these people uh, uh, work. And, you know, the Americans have had this objective of getting as much of the Balkans in, into NATO as they can since the collapse of the uh, uh, former Yugoslavia. Indeed, that was the purpose of the exercise. So, you know, it doesn't... It, I, I'm, I haven't spent an enormous amount of time, you know, researching Nimitz's background as, as you have, but that that's my assessment of the situation. Uh, it would be hard to, uh, I think, uh, attack this agreement by impeaching uh, his alleged uh, neutrality, and clearly he was not neutral. But I think I've articulated to you, in my opinion, the strongest legal arguments there under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But clearly he was not impartial. No, of course not. You could just read that document. We're on the air with Dr. Francis Boyle, scholar of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law here on the Dialogos Radio and the Dialogos Interview Series. Dr. Boyle, another one of the much-touted highlights of the PRESPA agreement is that it is supposedly Erga Omnis, meaning that the new name of North Macedonia is to be used universally for all uses, at least as far as I understand. Is the PRESPA agreement binding upon other countries, though, in this regard? Uh, For instance, I see that while the U.S. has recognized North Macedonia, Russia continues to just recognize Macedonia, uh, while that country's president, George Ivanov, refuses to sign any legislation that bears the name North Macedonia. So what is your take on this issue? Well, uh, Michael, they can call it Erga Omnes all they want to, but that does not bind uh, other governments in the world. Uh, the only way this could happen would be if there is a uh, United Nations Security Council uh, resolution adopting and approving the uh, PREPSA and ordering every state in the world uh, to to recognize uh, North uh, Macedonia, the name North Macedonia. That would be uh, Article 25, the UN Charter the members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. But until that happens, uh, uh, which my understanding it hasn't, uh, other states are, you know, free to use the old name if they want to. Now, obviously, uh, uh, the Greek government uh, or a new Greek government may or may not object Uh, There could be uh, uh, diplomatic correspondence. Perhaps there could be retortions over this. Uh, But no one can force another state to to change this name recognition if if they don't want to. So uh, there it is uh, in, in my perspective. 
Now, Dr. Boyle, you mentioned the UN Security Council. My understanding is that the agreement was delivered to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and my understanding is that the PRESPA agreement has been registered with the UN, but not as part of any sort of Security Council uh, binding resolution. So what does the registration of the PRESPA agreement at the United Nations mean in legal terms? Right. Well, uh, you know, I used to teach uh, United Nations law at Harvard and then uh, to undergraduates, and then I taught here for uh, several years. So the uh, uh, registration uh, with the uh, UN uh, basically only means that uh, uh, Greece and now North Macedonia uh, can invoke it, uh, the president. Uh, the press uh, at the UN uh, in whatever fora that it might come up in the uh, United Nations system itself. But the registration uh, with the UN uh, does not bind uh, uh, other states one way or the other. So if you know Russia still wants to keep calling it Macedonia, they can keep uh, calling it Macedonia, and you know, if other states want to do that, they can. So the registration does not uh, uh, really bind uh, any other state, and you know, people have to keep that in mind here uh, when looking at this this whole series and uh, sequence uh, of events. Uh, I, you know, I suspect you'll have uh, people making different claims, and I, I'm just trying to sort out these legal claims from my perspective as someone who is interested in the well-being of both the Greeks and, and the Macedonians. Now, let's look at some concerns that the people of each respective country have, uh, on, starting with a part of Greece. Uh, there are fears, Dr. Boyle, in Greece that despite uh, language and terminology in the PRESPA agreement, which prevents irredentist actions toward either country and the part of the other, that the recognition of a Macedonian ethnicity on the part of Greece opens the door to the recognition of a Macedonian minority within Greece. And indeed, there was a recent BBC report talking about such a minority. So the fear in Greece is that such a minority could then give rise to another Balkan-style conflict and separatist movement. And the argument is even being made that the name North Macedonia implies that there is a South Macedonia that it should eventually be reunited with. And there's some who feel that this is not a far-fetched scenario in light of uh, maps that have circulated of a so-called Greater Macedonia, which include Greek territory. So how do you see this issue, is this issue as a possibility? Well, you know, to be honest about it, obviously, uh, I think there are some legitimate fears here to that effect, yes. But if you read the agreement itself, uh, it, it tries to nail down North Macedonia as best as possible. I mean, uh, I, I, I've criticized the agreement, okay, so please understand that. But uh, they... The agreement itself has really tried to put uh, North Macedonia here into a straitjacket. So I, I don't know, e even though I, I don't discount these fears. But on the other hand, I, given the current situation and that agreement, if the agreement is actually implemented, uh, I, I don't think these fears would, at the end of the day, be realized in a, in a political sense. But all I can say is, is if you read the document, it does appear that uh, they, they've they tried to put North Macedonia here into a straitjacket. There's no question about it, in, in my opinion. So I'm not discounting the fears. So let's pick up on that. On the flip side, you have made this argument, Dr. Boyle, that the PRESPA agreement uh, places Greece's neighbor in a straitjacket and essentially strips away a lot of its sovereignty and places it under Greek control. So could you clarify what you mean by this? And for instance, are you referencing uh, flyovers on a part of the Greek Air Force over that country's territory? Well, I, obviously, it, in this very short 
interview, I can't go through uh, all of it. But you know, just speaking from the perspective of a international law professor who has actually been involved in negotiating and, and drafting uh, of these agreements, uh, uh, there's just major, in my opinion, impositions here, encroachments on the uh, sovereignty of uh, 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 Macedonia beyond anything uh, I have seen, you know, in, in recent memory in some of these uh, negotiations I've been involved in, say, over in the Balkans, which, you know, again, in my perspective, raises the question, can this really work, uh, given these uh, 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 infringements, encroachments, on uh, uh, Macedonian sovereignty and, and basically uh, uh, subordinating Macedonia to Greece uh, uh, legally. I, I don't know if that is really healthy for both states or either state. And I don't know at the end of the day uh, how long that can hold up between you and me. Uh, I just don't know. I, I can't predict the future. As I said, I, I haven't been to Macedonia. I have been. I have been to Greece. I spent a good deal of time in Greece. So uh, th that's just the concerns I have in reading through this document. Yes. Now, Dr. Boyle, as we uh, get close to wrapping up, there has been a lot of chatter. Uh, and uh, there has even been an official nomination uh, of the prime ministers of the two countries, Alexis Tsipras and Zoran Zaev, um, for a Nobel Peace Prize as a result of signing the PRESPA agreement. And these calls, as far as I understand, uh, were first put out there by Foreign Policy magazine. And what's interesting here is that the CEO of uh, the parent company of Foreign Policy magazine also happens to be on the board of directors uh, of an NGO called IREX, which is listed as a donor to Matthew Nimitz's NGO, the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeastern Europe. We mentioned it earlier. It's based in Thessaloniki, Greece. So, Dr. Boyle, let me ask you, do you, do you believe that Tsipras and Zaev deserve the Nobel Prize? Well, let me say this. Foreign policy was uh, originally set up by the Ford Foundation. And we here in the United States know full well that the Ford Foundation is a front organization for the CIA. So you could figure that out uh, from there if, if that's uh, what what you want to do. I mean, I, I guess if they're going to nominate these two fellows for the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, they, they gave a Nobel Peace Prize to uh, Henry Kissinger for his uh, 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 genocidal war against uh, Vietnam. Uh, they gave one to Obama for doing absolutely nothing. So uh, from my perspective, the... Uh, uh, Norwegians there who give this prize out uh, surely have a wicked sense of humor. So uh, I don't know what they're going to do. But remember, Norway is a member of NATO. So these uh, 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 Nobel Peace Prizes given out by Norway have a tendency to uh, coincide uh, with the interest of the NATO uh, uh, alliance. But I mean, I, I have to say, uh, uh, Michael, for someone of my generation who opposed the Vietnam War, after they gave a Nobel uh, Peace Prize to Kissinger, uh, it was pretty clear to me, and I think others of my generation, that, that this is a, a total joke and a fraud. But if people want to take it seriously, uh, I guess you can't. I never have. And indeed, I've been you know, repeatedly asked to, uh, I, as a professor of uh, international law since I, I started teaching at Harvard in 1976, and you know, people have asked me to make Nobel Peace Prize nominations. I just broke out laughing. You know, it, for me, someone of my generation, this will always be the Kissinger War Prize. So there it is. So I, I don't take it seriously, uh, but, you know, I guess others might. They'll, they very well might try to uh, uh, sanitize this agreement, uh, to whitewash it, right, by putting the fix in uh, up there in uh, uh, Oslo in, in this NATO state. Because uh, uh, as we've seen, the, as I've argued, the whole objective 
here uh, was to sort of bootstrap uh, Macedonia into NATO by hook or by crook. So that being said, uh, and since you know Norway is a NATO state, and these these so-called no, <laughs> Nobel Peace Prizes are given out there by uh, Norway, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they they tried to whitewash this whole thing by. Uh, giving a, a Nobel Peace Prize to, to, to the two of them. Now, we're running out of time here, but one final question, Professor Boyle, before we uh, close out our interview. You've spoken about the validity or lack thereof of the PRESPA agreement with several media outlets in Greece's north and neighbor. Just out of curiosity, have any Greek media or any Greek organizations approached you at any time to discuss the legal aspects of the uh, PRESPA agreement? No, so you're uh, the first, Michael, and uh, I'm very happy to... Uh, well, actually, I, I did get a call at one uh, from one Greek media, and, and I just, you know, all these issues were so complicated, uh, all I could say was, well, you know, I stand by the comments I made in the uh, Macedonian press. Uh, and then he, he accepted that, and, and that was that. But you're the first major uh, group news media source uh, I have given uh, an interview to uh, on this matter, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I have a lot of friends there in Greece. Greece. I've been there all up and down that country. I even brought my new bride over there to uh, Greece uh, to, uh, shortly after we were married to see Greece. So, But uh, I, I, I'm afraid I, I just don't see this being lasting. I don't think the Americans really care. They they just wanted to get Macedonia uh, into NATO, no matter what what the cost there to uh, uh, the Greeks and the Macedonians. And I don't think they really had to do this agreement just over the name. But you know, again, these are my tentative conclusions, just reading through these uh, documents. And I I would strongly recommend that you know you you put together a committee there of uh, Greek. Uh, constitutional law experts and, and international law experts uh, to try to sort out some of the issues that we discussed uh, today. Well, Professor Boyle, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today here on the Alagos Radio and the Alagos Interview Series and for taking the time to analyze this very complex issue and for sharing your insights and your thoughts with us today. Well, again, thank you uh, for having me on. My uh, best to uh, all my friends over there in Greece. And I hope this can be sorted out because I'd like to see this dispute resolved peacefully between uh, both countries and, and both peoples. Wonderful. Well, I think that's uh, everybody's um, hope and desire. And uh, once again, uh, Professor Boyle, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to discuss and to analyze this issue with us today. Sure. Uh, happy to talk with you again.